prior to your diagnosis. And then a I have, then I have a whole folder that is your more recent work. Yeah, this yeah. Is, yeah yes. posthumous poem. Yes. <laughs> Pre-posthumous. Pre-posthumous. Yes, pre right. Prelude and little posthumous <laughs> poem. Yes. Prelude to a 21-volume 21, uh, 21 suicide note. I think it's Leroy Jones. It's a great, great title. Preface to a 21-volume suicide note. Huh? All one sentence, all one long, dark, strange, radiant sentence. So I am interested to know when you started writing poetry. Early, early, early. My grandfather, step-grandfather more precisely, was a night watchman at Nally's. He used to read uh, Robert Louis uh, Stevenson's uh, 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 Child's Garden of Verses to me when I was a midget. Yes. You know, and it stuck. Yes. And, uh, and then uh, I would go out like a lonely, romantic young man uh, to this craggy precipice and 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 read John Keats to myself, you know, yes. like a beautiful experience, you know, at night under the stars and stuff, you know, so thing of beauty and all of that. And how old were you then? Oh, I'd be 14, 13, somewhere around in there. It, the, the poetry and the stars were the only things in my neighborhood that I, I, I weren't soiled by human fingerprints. Dangerous, wicked, distorted, perverse human fingerprints, you know. Uh, and uh, the stars they couldn't touch. And if you went out, uh, got out of the neighborhood at night, I had a little small refractor, 60 millimeter refractor, out to Azimuth Mount, and a cat, and a book of John Keats poetry, and my own journals. You could go up a couple of candles at night, you could go up to what they used to call Heartbreak Hill. It used to be an old prison, and they had all the prisoners carve the roads out of this rock. Eh? Seven guys were reputed to have been hung and buried on the property. And then they turned it into my junior high school, S.J. Willis Junior High School. But there were some little precipitous places where you could isolate yourself with a telescope. And have a really honest, solitudinous, beautiful, mystical night with the stars and John Keats. And some of the most beautiful memories of my life. Still. What town was this? Victoria. That was on Victoria. You know, and uh, so the way leads on the way, you know. And then, uh, and then I met a, 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 a poet. A, a, Poet professor from Berkeley, Jerry Schwartz, and he read Fern Hill one day in an English class he he was giving that I was taking, and uh, and I was just so struck by that poem and the way he read it that I was I was an addict for life. I was done then, and then I made a very serious commitment to myself and to poetry to bumble my way through it as best I could and try to do the best I could, whatever that was. But I knew what direction I was going in early. So how old were you when you 16. wrote your first poem? 16. Oh no no no! I was publishing when I was I was ten years old. I'd steal from E.J. Pratt about, I wrote poems about Dunkirk and stuff like this. We were raised on cowboy movies and, and, and war movies in my generation, you know. Born in 48, how could you not, not be, you know. You know, so, so uh, you know, I was writing poems like that and some, some more fragile, more tender kinds of poems as well. Do you have any of your early poems? Oh, right? hell no, 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 long, long gone. Well, well, it should, but, you know, well, it's all going in the wind anyway, so, you know, let it, let it. You must get used to it now. You know, well, you know, little little blo little rusty blossoms of things I did when I was young. My mother probably has some packed in a blue steamer trunk somewhere. Ask her. <laughs> Where is your mother these days? I'm Victoria. Yeah, she's 93. She's made it through three major cancer operations, full colostomy, and it's gone into full remission. And she has her wits about her, and the most incredibly beautiful handwriting still. It tells you how steady she is. Uh, the difficult thing for me, the most difficult thing in all this experience is trying to write in my mind the letter that I'm going to write to her very shortly before somebody else does, to tell her that she's going to see her firstborn son go to his grave probably before she does. Though nothing's written in concrete, but the probable concourse is that I'll have. You know, so that's a cruel letter, you know, because this woman, I wouldn't be here. The best part of me is her. You get it? What is your mother's name? Nenetkashka Tamara kissed me and Kostin when she was, when she was a, a, the eldest daughter of my Russian grandfather. But we call her Nina, Nina White, you know, you know, so, and I love her dearly, she really is, and she deserves, a, it ain't the golden years for anyone here, that's for sure, but at the same time, there should be a type of uh, liberated serenity that uh, overcomes you at the end, and she certainly deserves it, you know. I'll stay mad at God for at least a hundred thousand years if he doesn't make sure that, or she doesn't make sure that that, has, that, that isn't remiss in redressing that. And I'm, I, I'm feeling culpable, culpable as hell because I'm the, I'm the meteor that comes speeding out of outer space and boom, mom, um, you know, two tumors. Uh, 
last year or about half a, six six or eight months ago, my brother had his right leg cut off for diabetes too. And that's enough of a shock to the system as it is. And now comes this on the heels of it. It's bound to wreck your old, your retirement. And yes. it's wrecking mine. Yes. I can't see how it's not going to wreck hers. She's a mother. She knows how to love way more than I've ever known how, you know, so. Why are you in Perth rather than in Victoria? Oh, I taught in Ottawa for years. You know, I came out here to teach English at Carleton and, and uh, started magazines and started radio shows and publishing houses and reading series and, and started marriages and kids and books and, and became the poet laureate and got involved in a whole variety of causes and started learning Arabic and, you know, all kinds of things, you know, all kinds of reasons. I wanted my daughter to be bilingual totally, and she is. And, and, and the, you become enamored of the place. And I like the Four Seasons. As a painter, it intrigues me to see the, the change of the seasons and the colors of winter, uh, which, uh, which they have out here. You see it in BC as well, but out there I remember running with my camera. If I saw six little yellow leaves clustered among all the evergreens to take a picture of fall, you know, and I come out here and I see this conflagration of maple trees and that it astounds me still. You know, and I, I, I feel the rhythms of life out here somehow more through the mammals than I ever did through the flow of the fish in the West Coast. Though, though you know, my brother-in-law's a fisherman, and I grew up on an island and hung around fishing ports and that all my life as a kid. You know, there's just something about it. Uh, years ago, I, I bought an old cheese factory for about 10 grand, and it was boarded on a friend's place, and they were out walking on my acre on my land without my permission. Uh, I had to practice. Uh, and they were walking along and they found this little plaque and, and it was right in the soil, it was like soil level. And they brushed the leaves off of it and it said Patrick White, 1910. And then when I got the deed to the cheese factory, it had been owned by 40, no less than 40 whites in succession uh, through the generations. It was the old McGee post office at one time on an island in Black Creek. And uh, they built a bridge and sort of left it sitting at the side of the river, you know. You know so it was curious and it's always haunted me and I have a kind of almost a nostalgia for the land here at times. It's, it's a love and a nostalgia and a strange distant remembrance of something that has a, has a sweet, sweet uh, uh, cutting pathos on it. It cuts your soul, you know? Like, like you know this place, but you don't have any factual data in your head to confirm that. It's just a, an intuition, you know? You know so, but I'd lived in this town for 35 years, cheap rent, Visual volumes of all the open fields that act as a substitute for wide open abysmal oceans walking along the beach by yourself, you know, you can clear your head, you know, there's all that space and time there for you, you know, and you can do that out here with the open fields too. You can't do that in the canyons of the moon in Ottawa where you keep the light bulb all on all day because you're three feet from your neighbor's lot with his car parked sideways showing its axle in your window when you pull out the drain. You know, couldn't do that. But out here there's still an openness. This is a pioneer suburb of Ottawa. It won't be forever, you know, but uh, but it is now still. So it has its beauties and its charms. You're close to nature, and like flowers, and going for walks, uncultivated walks, and in the quasi wilderness, wild, you know, overgrown farmland around Maverly and stuff like that. Very beautiful. Lots of water lilies. So your poetry often has a cosmological undercurrent. Yeah. That permeates. Yeah. Much of what yep. you write. I'm sedurialized, highly so. And I know that you worked in an, at an observatory at one yep. point. And what observatory was that? And how do you feel that your love of astronomy has influenced you as a person and also your writing? Rilke has an interesting poem where he says, Work of eyes is done. Now let the work of heart begin. And, and it's an, you, you have to open the eyes in, you know, eyes in your heart and your blood eventually. But I started out at 14 working at the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory, uh, doing, uh, measuring the amount of calcium under the, un, under the spectrographic, under the spectrograph of, of the light that you just run through a telescope into a spectrograph, taking a photograph of, and, and translate it into metric, ma uh, mathematical graph. And you measure the area under it and it tells you how much calcium is in that star, it, it, it say it's calcium. And then you go look up a catalog to see if there's been any significant change in it, which would be, to, be talking a radical change, in which case you have to start applying theoretical uh, ideas to the situation or the dilemma or the mutation in order to explain it, should you want to. 
you know. So I did that kind of thing, a lot of measurement mo mostly. But I was I was very proud to be uh, to be working there and uh, and to be up in this great mysterious dome that had the largest telescope in it in 1911. It was the largest telescope in the world, 72 inch diameter. Uh, they didn't count an inch of chromatic aberration around the periphery of the lens, right? They were very honest. And then Toronto built exactly the same blueprint, exactly. But they lied about the inch of, they included the inch, so they, they usurped the title of the largest uh, telescope in the world. And I don't think I've ever forgiven them out there to this day, and that was 1910, <laughs> you know? So, so I, it was mysterious for me. It was the Mysterium Tremendum at Fascanans, you know? The tremendous and mysterious, fascinating, a mystery of why we're here. Not so much that we're here uh, to understand why we're here, but that we're bloody well here at all to see this, you know? And you're humbled and you're exalted at one and the same time. And the calcium in our bones is, and comes it, from the supernova yeah, The whole explosion composition of, of your body's gone through the life. Yeah, your star stuff. Yeah. Your star mud, as I put it. Yeah. You know, we're all star mud, you know? And, uh, and, and how could anybody not be fascinated? You're, you're fascinated with the fire wounds of your being out there, you know? I uh, suffer very intense forms, and I have this in common with other astronomers of a, a type of homesickness. And it's not, it's not hippy dip chatter talk no. or anything like that. It's a deep, pathetic, almost sad longing for return to uh, them. And Van Gogh's beautiful metaphor about when you die, you, you, you know, if you die in an accident or suddenly or abruptly, you know, it's like flying to the stars, you know. But, 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 but if you die a natural death, it's like walking, you know. But everybody's going to the stars, you know. Yeah, Egyptian stargates in Orion and all of that, you know. So, so it, it's 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 a it's a it's a, a very old, ancient migration path for the human soul, you know, to the stars, to the stars, and it's as good as any sky burials. Go black, go Beckley Tepley sky burials, you know. Send it up. So I know this sense of homesickness that you describe runs through my own soul. Mm -hmm. and through the hearts and souls of many deep-feeling, sensitive types that I know. And at the same time, there are rapture, rapturous poets, you know, mm -hmm. such as Rumi and Hafez, who are not homesick because they are feeling that immensity in the present moment here. So I, this was not... You don't always feel it, to quote Jalaluddin Rumi, when the doors of the temple is shut, we just walk away. Yes. They're not feeling yes. it. The door's not always open. Good point. You know. Good uh, point. It closes and it shuts like an eyelid. Yes. But the fact is, you're no more bothered by it than you are by bothered by the closing, of, the closing and shutting of your eyelid, or the changes of the phasing of the moon from nymph nubile to crone, you know, uh, or, or or a life, birth, death, you know. Death is just the crone phase of the moon, the Kali phase. It's dark. It's got. It's got these strange little surrealistic mystic insights into it all, you know. But it's it's no no less a season, uh, and and no more profound than any of the other seasons, you know. You treat them with equanimity. It's like a movie screen. Maybe it's third eye is your pineal gland, and it's projecting onto a holographic electromagnetic uh, movie screen in your mind. Well, you might be watching Anna Green Gables. And you think it's very happy and ah oh, like that, and then on comes a Stephen King horror flick. Oh, God, it's awful. We're going to run from that. But, but the images are equivalent. It's just an image, or just a wave on your own holographic projection screen, you know? And to be afraid, it's like a man who died of fright in front of a painting of a tiger he did that was so realistic it scared him to death. <laughs> you know? This is ridiculous. It's, uh -huh. it's like the ocean being afraid of its own weather. How can the bloody sea ever be imperiled by its own storms? You know? Or vice versa. There's no peril there. It's a cycle, it's a circle. It's so do you think through. we just came here to feel this immense, deep, poignant longing? We came here to see and be happy. That's why people were born. It's very clear. As happy as we can be. There's all kinds of obstructions and qualifications and limitations and bounds on that. The mind forged manacles, mostly, as Bray called them. Shuck them, you know, shuck them like a corn cob. Try to get rid of them and get as naked as you can, as open as you can in the world, you know? grow to be a human-sized universe of your own. You fill the whole damn thing up at every moment, you know, and then you can say as the Upanishads does at the beginning, this is perfect, that is perfect. Take perfect from perfect, it's still perfect. Hmm? That was a quote to you coming from God's own zero. <laughs> I'm a nothing. If you add me to one, I amplify it ten times. Isn't that strange? Add two of them, it's a hundred. I can go on like this forever. 
Pretty size, like I, I'm pretty sure I'm making the size of the universe. <laughs> How many zeros is it gonna take? <laughs> huh? It's easy. You already are. It's just the way you see it, the way you misperceive it, is what limits it. Nobody has to go out and try to make it so. It's so for everything here, everything from the smallest grain of sand to the shabbiest flower to you to me to the biggest galaxy out there. It's that way for everything here. Fills up everything all the time. Nothing's ever missing. I promise you. So from all of your nights spent stargazing, of which I have many as well, do you feel a stronger affinity or fondness for some of the 